more complex uh, molecules. So rennet, as I mentioned last time, its job is to clip off the negative charges that are surrounding the protein bundles. And instead of pushing away from each other, all the little protein bundles in milk can then grab onto each other. All right. So it has a very specific purpose in, in severing those neg negative connections. It gives the, if you imagine the protein bundle to be a koosh ball, it goes in and gives the koosh ball a buzz cut. And instead of pushing away from each other, all the koosh balls can, can grab on and form a, a gel-like meshwork that's gonna trap the water and the fat inside. So the cultures here, we talked a little bit about how cultures were organized and categorized by culture companies. So we have the starter culture. By the way, you can purchase these at giantmicrobes.com if you, if you want some little extra decor for your apartment. Uh, the starter cultures are the, are the ones who get the process started. They are lactic acid bacteria. So there's many, many different types of lactic acid bacteria that you could purchase from a culture company or would be present in your raw milk. Raw milk tends to be rich in a number of starter uh, cultures, lactic acid bacteria. So these little guys are going to, uh, as their name implies, create lactic acid. They eat sugar, the lactose, and they turn it into lactic acid. And that's really important for getting that process started. As I mentioned last time, these bundles of protein that are in, in liquid milk, bundles of chains of proteins, they're, they're tightly bound together by the mineral glue, the calcium phosphate in milk. And so as the starter cultures start to do their job, eat the lactose in milk, turn it into lactic acid, it begins to dissolve the calcium. So the more acidic your milk and cheese making soup gets, the more you're dissolving away the glue that's holding those proteins together. Okay, so you've got the bundle of chains of proteins, you put the starter culture in, nice warm milk, like body temperature of a cow, the 98 degree range. If you've refrigerated your milk, you're going to want to heat it back up to that, that sort of milk start temp which is where your starter cultures are going to be happy and reproductive. So the starter culture is eating that, sh that lactose, the milk sugar, turning it into lactic acid, dissolving the glue, holding your tight little bundles of protein together. And as that happens, they start to swell up because they're not being held so tightly together in the center anymore. So your koosh balls are starting to swell, your protein bundles are swelling. And then usually after you add the starter culture is when you add the rennet. So different recipes will call for waiting a certain amount of time before adding rennet and call for different proportional amounts of rennet. So once you've got those koosh balls kind of loosened up to whatever extent is appropriate, then you add that rennet, that enzyme goes in and clips off all the negative charges and allows all of your swollen up koosh balls to grab onto each other. And that's how you can control how much water you've grabbed and the texture of your curd to begin with, okay? So that's a little bit of just about the start of the process. We'll keep talking about that. Uh, and then we also uh, mentioned that you're adding at the same time you add starter cultures, that's when you're gonna be adding the rest of your cocktail blend. So you might be adding Brevibacterium linens or the B linens that will create an orange sticky surface on your cheese once you start washing the cheese with the brine. You might be adding a yeast, a little guy in the middle there. The yeast is really important for getting a rind started. So most natural rind cheeses will have a yeast added with this culture cocktail that's uh, put into the milk at the beginning of the cheese making process. That yeast is very acid tolerant. So it's these adjunct cultures, these ripening cultures I'm talking about, they just kind of chill for the cheese making process and they come into play in the caves, but you add them at the beginning all the same. They might start multiplying. You're going to have, you know, more and more of these cultures present in your milk and in your curd as you go, uh, but they come into play. Their role is later on in the process. So that yeast, once you have your finished cheese in the cave, it can stand the acidic environment that you've made by turning all that lactose into lactic acid. And it's going to be happy to grow before other ripening cultures. So the Brevibacterium linens, the selective pressure of the cheese rind, 
the acidity in this case is going to suppress the sticky orange wash drying cultures from growing. So they are there, they're ready to do their job, but they're not turned on until the conditions are just right. So yeast is a conditioner of sorts. It can grow in an acidic condition. It starts to break down protein. It actually starts to eat acids, but it also starts to eat proteins. And when it eats proteins, uh, it digests them into you know, component parts of proteins, which are amino acids and those component parts, which are free, you know, free nitrogen and uh, ammonia, basically. So that ammonia that's coming out of the broken down protein is alkaline. It's the opposite of acidic, and it'll start to absorb some of that acidity, along with the yeast actually just straight up eating the acids, turning them into I don't know what. Um, they, uh, it's going to decrease the acidity on the cheese, which, as we need to remember, increases the pH. Those numbers are inverse. So as acidity increases, the pH number goes down. So the pH is being lowered by the the yeast, uh, and then that makes a happier place for those B linens to then be activated and start growing. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, hey, it's not so bad. You know, this is, this is right where I like to shine, and they can start doing their life process, multiplying more on the surface of the cheese, starting to change the appearance, starting to break down fats and proteins themselves, and create flavors and textures. They'll start to soften the cheese from the outside. Really, it's the same story with the Penicillium candidum or Penicillium camemberti. So there's Penicillium strains that are the fluffy white flora that would grow on a bloomy rind cheese. So again, the yeasts are going to grow first, and on the surface of the cheese, it starts out kind of wet and drippy and shiny, and then it goes to like a matte appearance where you can't really see anything there, but it, it's not shiny anymore, and that's a sign that your yeast has got gotten a hold. Usually there's a yeasting phase of cheese making, especially for soft cheese, because the yeast is so important to rind formation, that in the creamery, before we even send the cheese to the caves, it'll spend a day or two in kind of like a medium warm room, like cool room temperature. Uh, so warmer than a cave, but a little cooler than the cheese making room, which can be in like 90 degree Fahrenheit. It's, you know, a really warm room is the best for cheese making. So we put it in a place where yeast really likes to grow. You get that just ripping, and then you can put it in a cooler vault that will favor those Brevibacterium linens, those Penicillium camembertis, the bloomy rinds, the wash drying cultures, and that they will have an easier time growing if that yeast went first. So cheese rinds aren't usually a you know one one microbe show. It's usually a tapestry or community of microorganisms that will form and layer in this like successional nature. And um, as we, as we'll learn in later presentations, those, um, the, the pace of the microbes, like I'll go first and then I'll make a happier place for you to live and then I'll outcompete you and you'll die down and this other guy will get started. That's a big part of the story. So those, sec those adjunct cultures, those secondary ripening cultures, are added to the beginning of the cheese make, but chill and wait until they're perfect time to come out later, all right? Got ahead of ourselves a little bit, but it's, it's good to know. Okay, what else are we adding to the milk? We're adding, um, we're at, sorry, what else are we adding to the cheese? We're not gonna add salt to the milk. We're gonna wait till the curd is made, and I'll talk about that more. And then there's some other ingredients that might come up on the test. So the funny little furry pod that we can see here is annatto. That's a natural, it's a little seed that's uh, from some rainforest, and I'm sure it's grown responsible these days. I actually have some in my uh, fridge that I found in a regular grocery store because it's used for coloring in certain uh, cuisines, cultural cuisines. Um, so you can, you can find it pretty easily, and the little pods look just like that, and they're pigmented. They don't have any flavor, and when they're ground up, it's often, I think, available in a liquid format for cheese making. It's just a super powerful pigment that will stain the cheese curd that you know yellow cheddar color. I think a long time ago people were using that as sort of a brand marker. I think they also started tinting cheeses when they were reducing the amount of butter fat and trying to keep the rich buttery look in their curd. And then somebody you know had a heavy hand one day and was like, "This is very distinctive looking. I'm going to make sure people know." what my cheese looks like with that orange uh, color in it. Okay, so that's a natto, a flavorless orange colorant, naturally derived, used in cheese. There's herbs and flavorings of all different sorts. 
we, that can be added to a finished cheese. There's also ash, which a long time ago, a French housewife um, sprinkled on her freshly made cheese to keep the flies away. But what she didn't realize is that ash is alkaline. So it's, again, something that will temper acidity and help microbes grow. So she was actually helping the microbial profile of her rind without realizing it, just trying to keep the flies off it. So uh, that's usually just uh, vegetable ash, um, like incinerated wood or uh, vegetable scraps, I think. Then there's um, calcium chloride is something that is added. And this isn't even an industrial additive. It's considered a processing aid and doesn't even need to be listed in the ingredients. But I have seen test questions on it. So calcium chloride is kind of like adding extra glue or extra minerality that can help increase yield. So you, by adding a little bit of extra minerality, minerals, the calcium chloride, you, you usually get a little bit more of your protein to stick together and you don't lose as much in the whey. So that's something even at a small artisan scale, it wouldn't be unusual for someone to add a little bit of dose of that extra calcium and they'll see, you know, an extra pound or so of cheese in their make from uh, just, just helping all of those, you know, proteins stick together. Okay, so even though we're dissolving, I know that's a little counterintuitive, even though we're dissolving some minerals to help our couche balls swell, we're definitely not um, dissolving all of it, especially for most cheese makes. So any cheese that has kind of a rubbery texture or any kind of elasticity is going to have residual, residual minerality. So there's a, it's a sliding scale of how many minerals you're dissolving over the course of the cheese making process. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on here. Let's see. Um, calcium chloride we covered. Oh, one last thing to talk about is lipase. So lipase is another enzyme that is added directly to the milk. Most of the time we're using a ripening culture like B. Linens or Penicillium camemberti to bring their enzymes to the party. So as they're doing their life cycle, they're eating and excreting and growing, reproducing. They're uh, and when they die, especially, they'll break open and contribute enzymes. So basically, their digestive juices are enzymes. Um, so enzymes are being brought to cheese making by microbes, but there's two cases in which that I know of that you'd add these enzymes directly to the pot, which is the rennet. And you're just skipping the microbe stuff, just adding the, adding the enzymes straight up. And then you are, you would be doing that with lipase too. So lipase is is, a, is very similar to rennet. And in fact, it's also was discovered in that fourth chamber of the unweaned calf in the abomasum, which is where rennet is harvested. So humans figured out that in the fourth chamber of a calf's stomach who is still having a, a milk diet, that there was an enzyme that would curdle the milk. And that, of course, slowed down the calf's food so they'd have time to glean the nutrients from it. Um, and it, and it is what led to the discovery of cheese. And so there's different traditional ways of harvesting rennet. The French have a preparation called cayette, where they're taking the whole abomasums and they're salting them and drying them. And that retains a lot of lactic acid bacteria, actually, and all of those natural enzymes in the calf's stomach, well, almost all of them, uh, a certain sort of profile of enzymes. So when we make our alpine-style cheeses, like Alpha Tolman and Highlander, we are actually using Cayette instead of adding commercial rennet or starter culture. We're, we're able to actually replace starter cultures and rennet by using this cayette, the salted, dried, sort of fermented abomasum. It's super cool. It's very natural. There's a lot more diversity of enzymes and, uh, and starter culture, lactic acid bacteria in there than if we were buying you know, commercial preparations of the two. So it is the more diversity of these microbes and enzymes, the more diversity of flavors that you're going to get later, some more complexity of flavors and aromas. So lipase is something you can buy now to mimic the Italian way that rennet used to be prepared. So they would, instead of salting and drying their abomasums like the French to make the cayette, they would put it in a, a liquid brine, a salt brine, and that liquid preparation captured a lot more fat-hungry enzymes. So 
Um, when something ends in ASE, -S -E, A's lipase, it in indicates enzyme, and lipase is fat loving, lipid eating enzymes. And so that lipase breaks down fats during uh, cheese ripening and gives you that animally kind of spicy flavor. The best way to describe what this tastes like is a super sharp aged provolone. You know that back of the throat kind of bite? I thought that was sharpness. That's what I always described as sharpness. And then Pat Powalski, who's a cheese genius, who he's, you can follow him at Cheese Science Toolkit. He explained in a sensory class that I took that sharpness doesn't have an actual meaning other than it's volumetric for flavor. So a mild cheese would not be as sharp and a strong cheese would be sharp. I thought sharpness was that bite. And so I raised my hand and I was like, Pat, if sharpness is just an indication of how much flavor there is and not a specific kind of flavor or sensation, then what is that back of the throat bite that I get from a super aged provolone or a New England style white cheddar? And that apparently is called throat catch. <laughs> it's the proper sensory term for that kind of bite is throat catch, which is not so marketable. So we'll just keep calling it sharp to customers. I think that's a lot of times what customers are looking for. But you've totally, I'm sure, if you've helped customers behind a cheese counter, just seen how how easily that sharp word is thrown around and is a little bit meaningless. In any case, lipase is what you would add now. You could buy it from a culture company, add it to your cheese make, and it's going to have that you know set of enzymes that's gonna break down those fats mimicking the old Italian way of making cheese and giving you those aged Italian hard cheese, uh, that bite, that spicy animally flavor, which as we know from the first presentation, that animally spicy flavor is associated with fat breakdown. Fat breakdown, lipolysis, fat breaking down enzyme, lipase. Okay. So here is the basic steps. You know, if you've ever read a cheese making book, you'll see some sort of break out of these principles. And each step along the way, it's important to note that you are paying attention to what's going on with your pH. Milk starts just south of seven, meaning it's just slightly more acidic than neutral. And as the cheese making process goes on, it's gonna drop lower and lower. The lowest I think a cheese make would typically get into is like the low fours. Um, most, unless you're having a lactic set cheese, which I'll talk about, um, you're probably going to be hovering in the five range at the most acidic your curd gets, okay? And then during ripening, as I mentioned, as those microbes start to do their job and eat fats and proteins, and especially eat proteins, release ammonia, neutralize acidity, then your pH is going to start creeping back up. So it's like an upside down bell curve if you would plot the, the pH of the cheese making process. Okay, so your the start pH of your milk can tell you things. It's a presentation for another day. That's a little bit more advanced. I wouldn't worry about um, what a cheesemaker is trying to figure out by looking at the start pH of milk, but it does inform them about you know how many cultures to add and what's going on with the herd at the time. Okay, um, so your and I also mentioned we're adjusting the milk temperature to be back to that kind of fresh from the cow temperature. So some cheesemakers really pride themselves on the fact that they haven't cooled and heated their milk back up. When you do that, you're changing the native profile. Even if you don't pasteurize your milk, you're still changing your raw milk microflora uh, by cooling it and heating it back up. And the reason that happens is you're favoring cold loving microbes and warmer loving microbes are gonna kind of give up or not have the advantage. And cold loving microbes tend not to be super helpful for cheese making. Um, it's really the mesophiles and the thermophiles we're really trying to to hone in on those medium temperature and heat loving microbes. Okay, so we are adjusting the milk temperature. We are adding the cultures, which is acidifying and coagulating. We're also adding the rennet in this step, okay? Um, we're paying attention to the pH the whole time. The pH is gonna help you know what the perfect time is to add your rennet you know, after you give your starter cultures a head start. Then once you've set your milk by acidifying and coagulating it with rennet, then uh, you're going to end up with a vat full of yogurt, basically. That's what it's going to look and feel like. It's going to have that kind of uh, fragile gel texture. And at this point, you're going to cut the curd. We're going to talk about that purple bubble here. 
uh, where we would not cut the curd up into small pieces. Um, but for most all recipes, unless you're making a lactic cheese, which we'll talk about, you're going to cut the curd and then stir the curd. So you cut the curd to create surface area for whey to escape. And then you stir the curd so it doesn't just fuse back together into one big ball again, which we'll tend to do. So uh, cutting and stirring. We actually, in our cheese making, we, it's, this is a super important step. So we first do a pre-cut, then we kind of let it fuse back together, but it's a little firmer than it was before we did that, you know, pre-cut with like kind of big cubes. And then it, it firms up a little bit, but sort of fuses back together. And then we go in and cut into smaller pieces and that the curd is a little bit more sturdy and it can hold up to that agitation of cutting and create uh, a little bit sturdier curds that we can then stir around a little bit more vigorously without shattering them. So you definitely have these like little fragile blobs that you're, you're trying to manipulate very carefully. Uh, the, the more you stir, the more those little blobs can um, expel some of their moisture and firm up and be easier and easier to handle. And uh, as I mentioned, it prevents them from just clumping together. Okay, some recipes are going to call for heating the curd, others will not. Usually the harder the cheese, the more likely that that curd was heated along the way. And the semi-soft cheese is probably going to be an unheated uh, cheese, okay? Then you're gonna mold, mold as in shaping the cheese, not as in growing stuff on it yet. So we're gonna remove the curds from the whey and put them in a container that will give it its final shape, okay? And that point of removing the curds from the whey is a very, very crucial, and that's definitely something that cheesemakers are using pH readings to, to time exactly when is the best. And also many experienced cheesemakers and those cheesemakers before pH meters existed or were available um, would have an intuitive sense of when the curd is ready. They might be tasting the curd to sense acidity just on the palate or using their fingers and hands to judge the firmness of the curd and how far along in the process it is. But that is an extremely crucial moment. And if you want consistency in your cheese make, you're definitely using pH to help guide that critical point. Okay. Then some cheeses will just gravity drain their moisture away. Other cheeses you have to apply direct force to in order to get them to drain to the point that you're looking for. And then you're going to apply salt to that finished cheese. Salt helps draw out excess moisture and kind of set the final moisture of the cheese. And it helps create the conditions on the rind for, um, for a, a rind to grow, if that's the type of cheese you're after but salt is really important no matter what. It has a big impact on which microbes are gonna be able to grow. So even if you're going to plastic seal or wax your cheese and you're not even trying to grow a rind, it's still salt is very important. If the salt is too low or too high, you're disrupting the balance, the ideal balance for whichever microbes you're hoping will thrive and contribute to the character of the cheese. Okay, so let's see here. I'm Nathan. Chime in and stop me if the internet isn't cooperating here. Um, there's some some sweet uh, jazzy music if you want to watch this on the internet. Um, but if this is showing up okay, these are Ayrshire breed cows, and that's our barn years ago before we painted a sweet mural on it. That milk can go right into our cheese house. At Jasper Hill, we also have a second herd of cows and a second creamery at this point, but we're still making a bunch of cheese in this space. And that's the vat uh, we can see in the corner here. The, it's a very typical artisan scale vat. We've since uh, graduated to a more specific blue cheese making vat. We used to make our soft cheese in it. So part of what this video is, is we got this new tip up system that we were all like super excited about and wanted to get videos of, but we were making soft cheese in that big silver, it's a Gouda vat is what it is. And that's usually the starter vat. That's usually what you'll see an artisan uh, cheese maker using. And what happens when you're trying to make a soft cheese, which is very sensitive in a vat like that, you set the curd, you cut the curd, you stir the curd, it's all going fine. And then you hit that magic moment where you're like, okay, the curd is perfectly cooked, sort of, you know, we need to get the curd out of the way. And in that silver vat we were bending over with a like a noodle strainer <laughs> pulling out with a colander 
you know, as many curds as we could, you know, lift up and then dump into the molds. And so it would take like 35 minutes to fish all those curds out of that vat. And you'd have to bend over and basically touch your toes with each dip. It was really hard on people and it took too long. So batches of cheese would be on the racks and the cheese at the top of the racks would be like perfect and pudgy. And the cheese at the bottom of the racks would be like hard. And if we tried to like shoot the gap in the middle, the ones on top would be runny and the ones on the bottom would be too firm. So the consistency within the batch was all jacked up because we couldn't get all the curds out of the way when the time was right. With a harder cheese or like a Gouda that we mentioned, that is a less crucial moment. You've got a little bit of time to spare. And we have now, we use round vats like this to make Alpha Tolman, but we have them up on a platform and then we can open a valve at the bottom of the vat and have this big nozzly elephant trunk looking hose that shoots all of the curd out of that way and onto a draining table in a short amount of time. So that's definitely something cheesemakers are uh, um, trouble, troubleshooting around is that trying to get that timing right. Okay. So we'll keep going here. So these are the tip up tip up bins and it's really cool. They're in, invented for a larger production, sort of more industrial cheese making process where you could have like a hundred of these and you'd have a, you know, sort of a milk pasteurizer on demand system, just pumping out, uh, you know, pasteurized milk at the right temperature into these bins and you can keep it continuously going all day long. Uh, for us, we just bought as many as we could fit into this room <laughs> or as many as we could fill from our like little mini pasteurizer. And as we grow and scale, we can just get a few more bins instead of having to buy a whole nother stainless steel vat. And the principle is, is here, we fill the milk with either raw milk or fill the bins with either raw milk or pasteurized milk, depending on the cheese we're making. Then we add starter culture to all of them. Um, uh, and then... And in fact, usually I think we culture the milk while it's still in the pasteurizer and give it, give the starter culture some time to multiply. And so we're putting cultured milk into all the bins, but we run it 10 minutes apart for each bin. So we'll, we'll run it the first bin, wait 10 minutes, run it the second bin. Then the first bin is ready to cut 10 minutes before the second. And so you go through the whole process of cutting and stirring and resting and stirring and resting and stirring all, um, all varied from bin to bin by 10 minutes so that when the first bin is ready to tip, that's the ninja cut, we call it the pre-cut. We're gonna do that and let it rest. Then after we let it rest and the curd's a little firmer, we use those harps to get the curds really cut into the right shape. Then they'll rest, then we stir. And so there's resting and stirring that, happens, stirring that happens periodically. And then when that first bin is ready to tip, the next one's got some time on it. And you can see this like cool analog crank. I think we've since hooked up a little, um, an automatic crank so we can like hit a button and it'll do it. But simple machine, love it. Dumps out all the curd all at the same time. So all that cheese is gonna have the same texture. And we've got 10 minutes to get to the next one before um, it'll, it'll get off track. So you can see the curd's a little too big to fit into the molds. They're kind of wiggling it around. It's shrinking, it's losing moisture. And so after a couple minutes, It'll all fit in its little draining cups. And then uh, they're resetting. So they're only doing one layer at a time. The molds underneath are to kind of prop, up, prop it up and then they'll fill that bottom layer last. It's still, we now have a turner where you, <laughs> so we don't need Tim Aiken, the football player, to turn those 60 pound stainless steel layers. We put them all in a big contraption and turn a wheel and they all flip over. Okay, so the next day, that cheese, if you saw, um, Evan doing this, knocking them out of the molds the next morning. He is like not being careful with them. He's picking them up three at a time. We now dry salt them, but we used to use a brine um, to salt. I'll talk about that more later, but they're very rubbery and firm when they're first made and they get soft only when they're ripened in the cave. So this is um, Ron the logger. We now call him Ron the stripper for this reason right here. He makes a living out in the woods. Um, he'll thin out spruce trees on people's land and then he'll sell the bark, the inner bark layer to us. So that's the cambium layer. It's amazing. It's like, um, yeah, here, he has two exacto knives uh, taped together. That's how he gets the perfect width. Very specialized tool he invented. All right, so then we end up with these strips. So you saw him scraping off the rough outer bark of a spruce tree. He tries to find ones without too many branches. 
And then he makes that incision and can peel off the whole cambium layer. So the cambium layer is the inner bark layer that transports nutrients up and down a tree. And it's like the living, the only living part of the tree trunk. And in the fall, it dries out and fuses and becomes a new tree ring. And in the spring, a new cambium layer forms. So it's a baby tree ring. And there's a certain window of opportunity during the year when you can um, peel that off the tree pretty easily. Okay, so we dry those strips out. So the one on the left is fresh. The one on the right has been just chilling, waiting until we need it. And then once we're ready, it's gotten sort of stiff. It's like a, it's like pasta <laughs> that's dried out. So we want it to be flexible again, and we want to sanitize it because we've been drying it out in a, in a dr drafty barn. And so we'll boil it and uh, it boils for a certain amount of time, which is effectively pasteurizing it just to, just to make sure we're about to put it on a fresh vulnerable cheese. And to make it flexible again, we rubber band it to the outside of the cheese and then it fuses. So, by the time the cheese is ready to wrap a few weeks into the aging process, um, we can cut those rubber bands off and the bark is sort of stuck on with the cheese. So this is the caves where we ripen. We built this cellar into, the, into a hillside and then we built seven tunnel shaped caves that radiate out from the center like the rays of the sun. We've got a te teams in there taking care of the cheese as it ripens. So for a bloomy rind cheese, uh, they would need to be patted and turned as they bloom. So you can see the fresh ones are kind of shiny there. That one's kind of turned um, turned matte. Then after the yeast grows, the fluffy white mold can grow. You can see it, we, that's why we call it a bloomy rind. It literally blooms and gets puffy and then it gets padded. And then at this point it would get wrapped in a special cheese paper that will, would allow it to keep ripening. And then um, at you know eight to 10 weeks is when it's gonna be this perfect texture and full flavor. Um, where you can literally scoop it out with a spoon. So it's amazing that this started out as a rubbery little hockey puck that you could toss around without bothering it. And then by the time it's ready to eat, it's been soft ripened so completely. Which we'll talk about more on in a, in a later episode. All right. So it's funny at the end of that video it's like catch harbison like coming out to a store near you this holiday and <laughs> now you can find it in all the stores all of the time all right so the this is that slide again about the lactic acid bacteria just to remind us how important it is to the cheese making process so this is continuously happening and keep that exponential reproduction in mind so at first it's the very slow burn making acidity you've got a few lactic acid bacteria starting it off but after a couple, you know, after an hour or so, you've got, um, you know, thousands. And then in, at, at, by a couple hours, you've got millions of individual microbes all uh, creating acidity and more of themselves. So it really starts to pick up steam and get more and more acidic more quickly as the cheese making process goes on, making that critical point of removing the curds from the whey that much harder to nail because it's getting, you know, quickly more, more quickly, more acidic. Okay. Then, of course, the starter culture come into play during ripening after they run out of sugar to eat and it becomes a dry and salty hostile place. They die and break open. They, they contribute their special enzymes and those enzymes are going to break down those protein bundles, um, those protein micelles and the fat globules start to break them apart of their complex multi-molecule form down to individual molecules. Those enzymes will just keep chopping and break down um, you know, the chains of amino acids that are a complete protein into shorter chains down to individual amino acids and even mess with those until they are, are aromatic and volatile and will get up into your nose. And that's what cheese aroma is. So when you source starter culture, you can choose them for the flavor that they'll make once they're done making acidity and they die and break open, which is kind of cool. Okay, so let's talk about, we talked about where animal rennet came from, the fourth chamber of an unweaned calf. The abomasum is the name of that unweaned calf. And if you see the word rennet on a cheese label, it should mean animal-based, animal-derived. So rennet implies animal rennet. If you see enzymes on a label, that implies a microbial rennet, which is scientists figured out how to get an algae, a lightly genetically modified algae, um, no big deal, to uh, eat a certain food and produce a ton of, of enzymes that are the same 
types of enzymes found in the abomasum of a calf. So they figured out how in a lab using algae to make a similar blend of pepsin and chymosin are the, the two enzymes that they're, um, that they're producing commercially. So you would get a commercial preparation, usually artisan cheesemakers, unless they're worried about appealing to a vegetarian customer or have vegetarian concerns themselves. I don't think you'll find too many vegetarian um, dairy farmers, but in any case, um, unless they're, they have a reason that they want to go for a microbial rennet, maybe they have um, a kosher customer base or just vegetarian sensitive. Larger production cheeses tend to have microbial rennet just to avoid those kinds of concerns, but I found that artisan cheesemakers tend to prefer real animal rennet. I think it's, it is, um, well, it's more authentic, I think, for a smaller artisan producer, but also it can avoid certain issues or, or sensory flaws associated with an enzymatic make. If you're making fancier, weirder cave age styles, I think microbial rennet can uh, be harder to control bitterness with. In any case, there's different reasons for making that decision, but that's the source of them. And then there's vegetable rennet. So this is a wild cardoon thistle that has in the stamen, like the little like fuzzy bits that grow in the middle of the flower are just chock full of enzymes. And it, I think it includes some pepsin and chymosin, but then a bunch of other enzymes. And it tends to be very aggressive in ripening, especially lipolytically. And so you'll have, think of um, Spanish torta style cheeses, Portuguese soft sheep cheeses, gooey amontegado, Sarah Destrellas, um, those kinds of cheeses, Torta del Cesar, they are like fruity, funky, animally weird, delicious, tons of aroma, and very, um, very big and unusual flavors. They're my personal favorite types of cheeses. And they get uh, very aromatic because of how many enzymes are in that wild artichoke or whatever it is. I think it's a wild cardinal thistle, is some kind of artichoke. And uh, that's typical of Spanish and Portuguese cheeses, but you're starting to see modern cheesemakers uh, using that a little bit. There's a couple American cheesemakers that are playing around with uh, vegetable rennets. Um, thistle, we, you also, you'll also just hear it called thistle rennet. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're looking at here are images from Harold McGee's On Food and Cooking, which is a great book that has dives into all kinds of science of cooking, you know, like what happens when you're searing a steak on a molecular level. But the first two chapters are on milk and cheese making, which I think is really cool. So on the left, this is a diagram. The left-hand side of both images should be the same. It's liquid milk. So this is where I got the beach balls and koosh balls. I was reading this book and I was like, hmm, how can I make a slide that explains this? Beach balls, koosh balls. So you see on the left hand side, you've got the protein micelles, the little koosh balls. There's little dots in there to represent the calcium holding them together. There's the fuzzy edges on the outside to represent the uh, kappa casein, the negatively charged protein that's helping them all stay pushing away from each other and um, and avoiding you know the the fat globules here too. So this is liquid milk on the left hand side of both of these types of coagulation. On the right, you see what the freshly knitted curd matrix looks like. So with the lactic coagulation, um, I'm going to skip to the next slide and come back to this. So don't panic yet. We're going to spend a little more time here. But this is the process of making a lactic cheese, which I've mentioned a couple of times. There's, this is a cheese that has a lot of acidity production. So this is Angie Keeler, one of our founding members. She is pregnant here with a kid who's in high school now. I think he just got his learner's, learner's permit. And so this is one of the first cheeses we made. And we made this cheese, this style, because you could make it in a five gallon bucket from the hardware store. So even before we had a nice stainless steel Gouda vat to make our blue cheese in, we were making this cheese because the materials for cheese making were, were relatively affordable. And the way we would do it is um, we'd fill these buckets with a fresh milking from the Ayrshire cows in the barn. And it was also a great system because as you got more cows freshening, and more milk coming online, you could just get another bucket. <laughs> and uh, I, I know in the beginning when they were trying to make their first batches of Bailey Hazen Blue, they didn't even have enough milk for the agitator paddles, the stirring paddles to hit uh, on you and using the vat. So Consumblos is a great starter cheese. 
lactic cheese. But this hand ladling technique is really typical of lactic set cheeses. So you can see there's 300 cups on the table and that was enough to fit the curd from about 40 Ayrshire cows from one milking. So they would take the evening milk, fill the buckets, and then they would add starter culture. So they'd milk the cows around five, get the milk right from the cows into the buckets. They'd flow it through a, a, a hose tube, you know, a dairy, dairy hose into the little pipeline, into the creamery, fill the buckets in a very sanitary way, add the starter culture, and then they'd have dinner and sit down and have dinner. And then after dinner, they'd go down to the creamery and those cultured buckets, they would add a little tiny bit of rennet compared to other cheese recipes and give it a good, good stir. Then they'd go to bed because uh, they had to get up again at four in the morning and milk those cows again. So they'd go to bed and then in the morning after milking the cows, they would uh, go into the creamery and they would have buckets full of what looked like yogurt. And you can see in the, the slide to the left, it's the best picture of what the texture of that curd looks like. You can see how that chunk kind of fell off the side there and kind of made a clean break. Uh, and then on the far right, you can see at the bottom of the bucket, it's kind of this like choppy curdy mess. The goal with a lactic set cheese is to get like big, juicy, unbroken curds into the draining cups. So she's using that four ounce soup ladle and trying not to disrupt the curd as much as possible. So with this cheese, she's not cutting and stirring. The cut is the act of the, putting the ladle into the curd and it's creating one giant curd blob, which is way too fragile to stir around. So she's gently kind of like letting it lay down into that cup. It's going to start losing moisture and draining pretty quickly. And if you make a big, perfect curd like that, it's going to drain really nicely for you. All those wonky little curd bits in the bottom of her bucket here, she's just about to um, do that last good ladle she could get and then kind of spread that over the rest of the cups so that not one cheese is just filled with the broken little, they call them shattered curd bits because they don't drain as well. And then you get kind of soggy areas in the cheese. So the curd handling is super important in this type style. So she put a, a blob of curd in the cup, keep going. And then by the time she got to the end, it went back to the beginning, that would have shrunk down by losing moisture, by draining nicely for her so that she could fit another scoop in. And then by the time she got to the end, it went back to the beginning, then she could fit another scoop in. So I think it took like six, six rounds of ladling to get all of the buckets from 40 cows into those 300 molds. You can see behind her, those are yesterday's cheeses. And it looks like they've been turned over and their cups are now upside down. So they would do that turning of the fresh cheese every few hours to help them drain evenly and get ready to, for ripening. And what they're, what's also happening in this warm room for those cheeses is the yeast is, act, is activating and probably um, getting going while that draining is happening, okay? So other you know, famous cheeses, Coupol, Bambouche, Valencay, Salsa Cher, the Loire Valley, those cakey goat cheeses. We think of goat cheeses mostly having this lactic uh, cheese make behind them. And Epoise is actually a, you know, a wash drying cheese with um, a lactic curd. Stilton has a lactic set as part of the cheese make. They, there's a period during the stilt making process where you let the curd um, sit and acidify for a long time and you ladle it using a like dinner plate sized ladle. Um, and then after you've um, turned very carefully those ladles, you, um, you then start to sort of start to treat the curd like a regular one. Like you, you, it takes days to make it and it's really hard on your body, <laughs> the traditional way to make it. Okay. So uh, we're going to go back here. So that lactic coagulation, what's happening there? It was an all night curd set, right? But the milk in the buckets in the evenings started ladling the next morning. So this is a typically a 12 to 24 hour process. And what's happening is a, just a ton of acidification and very little rennet action. So you're letting the koosh balls swell up until they literally fall apart. You actually hit a pH of milk down in the low fours, which is the isoelectric point of milk, where it becomes so acidic that the positive charge or the negative charge of those koosh balls doesn't even matter anymore. I don't even understand that on a chemical level, but that's how it has been explained to me. You get, it gets so acidic that, you know, the polarity is sort of neutralized. And so the koosh balls just fall apart. 
I did mention that we added a little bit of rennet in there. And so the little bit of rennet is just to, is to create little dots of glue that aren't, aren't living in bundles of protein anymore. They're sort of just like little bits of calcium glue that can help hook together those sort of loose rubber bands with each other as you can see in the right hand panel. So this is a yogurt and if there wasn't any rennet it would pretty much look like this but be even more fragile. So the difference between yogurt and a lactic unladled curd is literally just that little bit of rennet which gives it a little bit more body, a little more structure, but not much. It's fragile and if you mishandle that curd you shatter it, it doesn't drain well, it doesn't work very well. Those fresh cheeses, if you were doing what Evan was doing when he was unmolding the harbison, poking them out, dropping them on a table, they would splatter. They, they're not rubbery, they're cakey. It's, think about a fresh farmer's cheese, uh, even, or a, a drier ricotta. It doesn't have any elasticity at all. You know, there's no bend to it. It is a short break. It's like shortbread cookie dough versus uh, pizza dough. So what we're looking on the, at on the right-hand side is pizza dough. <laughs> this is what a harvest and curd would look like. So both of them are bloomy rind soft cheeses. One of them has a cakey, short texture and the other one has a rubbery long texture they're probably trapping a similar amount of moisture it's just the way that the moisture is trapped and the structure of the protein that's holding it all in so on an enzymatic side you're adding that starter culture you're giving the milk an hour or so to you know the to swell up those koosh balls then you're adding a good amount of rennet giving those koosh balls a buzz cut while they still have their structure then they all stick to each other and form a more sturdy rubbery curd meshwork okay and then you can cut, you can stir those curds. Um, you know, they're fragile at first, but as the process goes on, they shrink and become tighter and, and uh, easier to manage. So this is kind of a spectrum where the lactic coagulation, where you hit that isoelectric point of milk and it just gets so acidic that you, you've just swollen up and just destroyed your casein basically with acidity. Um, that's all the way at one end of the spectrum. And then basically you, you have a whole spectrum of how acidic you could make your curd. And the enzymatic coagulation isn't just like one or the other. The enzymatic coagulation, each cheese recipe has a different extent to which you acidify those curds before you add the rennet. And the more you're stirring your curds in the whey, the more you are acidifying them. And as you stir curds in the whey, you start to drill little holes through that rubbery curd and allow for more moisture to escape. So the more you stir, the more you're exposing your preformed rubbery curds to that increasing acidity. And that acidity is, is pitting little holes, allowing more moisture to escape, and you're drying your curd down as you're stirring. Also, the longer your curds are bobbing around in that rapidly acidifying way, the more you are losing calcium to the whey. So you'll end up with uh, a more and more crumbly cheese the longer you stir your curd in the whey and the more minerals are leached out during that process. So you're leaching out minerals, which helps moisture escape, but you're also losing potential elasticity of your curd. You're demineralizing your curd. Okay. That's a really important concept I've been talking about since slide one. All right. So this is more like the Harbison make, right? So uh, uh, this is, well, also just a chart about how recipes are usually structured based on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking for a soft end texture, you're going to be cutting, you know, walnut sized curds to begin with. And cheese recipes tend to list the curd sizes this way. It's like walnut, hazelnut, pea, then there's lentil, then there's rice, <laughs> which is like just a like visual guide for aiming for the, the size of the curd to be cutting to in the first place. So the smaller you cut the curd, the more surface area you're creating for way to escape and the firmer your end cheese is going to be. The bigger your curd is at the start, uh, the softer your curd is going to be. Okay, so then on the, along the bottom is what I was just talking about. As you're stirring the curd, you're continuing to expose that curd to the acidifying way and you're reducing moisture. There's an interesting um, technique that is used to help create a firm curd that hasn't, been demineralized too much. So it's called curd washing, washed curd cheeses. This is tricky because when I hear washed curd, I think about washed rinds, where you're taking a finished wheel of cheese in a cave, washing it with a salt brine and helping that sticky orange 
brevibacterium linens or sticky orange cheese community, cheese microbes to grow. So washed rind is different than washed curd. Washed curd literally happens to the curd while it's in the vat. And so Gouda is a great example of a washed curd cheese. Colby is a great example of a washed curd cheese. Edom, I think even Havarti. Um, cheeses like Raclette, um, we are making a, a sort of semi-firm cheese with a very bendy texture and we are washing, rinsing the curd. So there's, this is used in different types of recipes, but Gouda is the most common washed curd cheese that, you'd, that might show up on the test. And what's happening there is somebody was trying to dry down their cheese by stirring and they, it was taking too long that day, I'm sure this is the case, and they needed a firm cheese that would last through the winter. The wetter the cheese, the, ri the faster it ripens and the, the faster it'll go bad. So they're like, we need to dry this curd down, but if I keep stirring it any longer, I'm going to demineralize too much and I'm going to end up with a crumbly cheese. So how do I keep stirring the curd without losing too many minerals and ending up with a crumbly cheese? I want a nice, smooth, sweet cheese like we think of with a Gouda. So somebody got clever and drained off some of the whey and replaced the whey with water of a similar temperature, usually warm water. And that allows you to continue to stir, allows the curd to continue shrinking up. It's called syneresis. It's, na it's natural inclination to want to shrink as it's, as it's bobbing around. But instead of continuing to pit it with that acidity and dissolve away minerals, you can just stir it around and let it shrink in, in a more neutral solution by replacing whey with just plain water. So uh, that's a, a great tool to help maintain elasticity while drying it down a little bit. As I mentioned, um, sorry, I'm going to go back a slide here. I, another way of drying down curd without increasing acidity too much is curd cooking. Okay, so think about a mountain like shack where someone's trying to make cheese. <laughs> uh, days walk away from the village, all the cows are up in the Alps um, grazing and being milked. And they would put all the milk into a big copper cauldron. And then they didn't have a lot of time to be hanging out uh, or space to be manipulating curd. And so their goal was to get curd in and out of the vat as quickly as they could. And uh, so they would build a fire under the cauldron and cook the curd. And that would come up to a temperature. They wouldn't boil it. You kind of want to scald, it's like scalded milk temperature. So usually you can still kind of put your finger in there for a, a few seconds before it would be so hot you'd have to pull it out. But it can get pretty hot. Depending on the recipe, the temperature might go up. Um, and what that does, the heat helps increase the rate of syneresis. It helps those curds seize up and shrink and push out moisture more quickly. So you can get a nice firm dry curd. You're also going to start by cutting the curd really small cooking the curd to help it shrink up and push out moisture, and you're getting it in and out of the vat really quickly without spending um, the time using acidity to do that. And so you end up with a nice uh, minerally curd that hasn't gotten crumbly. And so when we think of an alpine style cheese, we think of that smooth texture. We think of that sort of bendy elasticity. Um, when we think of a cheddar, like a cheddar cheese like that, that the cheddaring process is the process of you cut the curd, you stir the curd, you drain the whey, and you end up with a bunch of curd bits, usually on a big horizontal vat or a table. And you let them sit and settle, and they will, you know, kind of juicy curds. And they still have a good amount of minerality. They're kind of bouncy, and they will knit together into these big bricks or a brick big long continuous curd sort of forms, it all sort of fuses together. Then you cut that into big bricks, big blocks, and you pile those blocks on top of each other to help use the weight of the curd itself to push out extra moisture. And you let them sit like that. Then you'll go and you'll reverse the order. The curd bricks that are on top, you'll put them on the bottom and you'll stack them up the opposite way. And that takes time. And in that time, allowing for draining, you're also um, there's also acidification is still happening with the curd and that continuing continuous acidification will um, help draw create pathways for moisture to escape by pitting the you know minerals out of the, the protein matrix and uh, you end up with a dry curd that's lost minerality and you end up with a crumbly cheese and so that process of stacking the curd is 
it's called cheddaring. So it's become a verb because of the way that that cheese is made. So depending on curd handling techniques, how long you're stirring the curd in that acidifying way and what you're doing to the curd afterwards, you're affecting how many minerals are gonna be left in the cheese and the texture you're gonna end up with. So it's important to think about, you know, cheese texture in terms of hard to soft, sure. So higher moisture cheeses are softer, lower moisture cheeses are firmer. Um, but also you can place cheeses along a spectrum of um, minerality or short to long texture. So short textured cheese, like a lactic set cheese, like a fresh chev, or a cheddar, maybe a manchego, a really kind of flaky, hard, brittle cheese. That's going to be on one end of the spectrum. They might have had a similar, you know, um, terminal pH, higher acidity production, lower pH. Terminal pH is like the lowest pH reading that the make process gets to at whatever point. And, um, and, uh, and the difference between those cheeses is the amount of moisture. So hard cheese has much less moisture, so curd handling techniques to force moisture out, whereas you could have a very acidic cheese like a chev where you're careful to make nice big juicy blobs that kept um, some moisture in there. Lactic set cheeses just tend to create that sort of um, unstructured meshwork that is a sort of just like a sponge that that holds moisture in. Okay, then on the other end of the spectrum, we have um, cheeses that still have a good amount of minerals. So um, a cheese like Harbison that starts out kind of bendy, but ends up being very high moisture, which you can tell once it's ripe and you have to use a spoon to eat it. And then you've got uh, a low moisture cheese with still a lot of minerals like a Swiss cheese. You can see you can bend that slice all the way over on itself. This might be a processed cheese maybe, but it gives you the idea. You can picture a bendier texture on an alpine style cheese than you'd see on a cheddar or a manchego. So you could plot, you know, every cheese in your case on this matrix and kind of see where the chips fall in terms of um, short to long texture, short texture crumbly, long texture bendy, uh, and high to low moisture. Okay, finally we're going to talk about um, salt before we wrap things up and we got a late start but this is uh, just just coming in at about an hour which is perfect here. So the salt is important as I mentioned for more than just a flavor enhancer. You know when you making or you're making a soup and you're tasting it and it's missing something and you add the salt and all of a sudden it seems to wake up the palate and you you notice more nuances than you would have otherwise. That is important for cheese and under salted cheese is boring and um, uh, perfectly salted cheese just it seems like it helps you get all of the aromas somehow. I don't know how that works physiologically. So it's a flavor enhancer, sure, but it's so important for other reasons. It will slow down starter production. So once you add salt, you're really slowing down the rate of reproduction and acidity production from your starter culture. So salting really sort of signals the end of cheese making and the beginning of ripening for that reason. And then you, with that said, you know, there are, starter cultures do have acid tolerance, so they're not gonna totally stop. So if you don't hit the right moisture targets and if your, your cheese is retaining more whey than you hoped it would, if it's not draining properly, you could continue to have acidification that you don't want. It's called post-production acidification. So for instance, we had a, you know, we were having problems with the cheese. We couldn't figure it out. The texture just wasn't right. It was getting sort of a crumpled look like a Sharpe where it looked good at first then all of a sudden it sort of collapsed on itself and had a chalky texture and the flavors weren't developing right. And what was happening is it was in a, the room where it was draining was too cold and the curd was too tight. You know, it's more relaxed when it's warm, when it's cold, it's more um, rigid and it wasn't able to drain as well in that colder room. So it retained moisture and that acidity kept kind of eating away at the minerality and the nice, plump wheel shape ended up collapsing on itself because of that continued acidification drawing out those minerals um, and redistributing them in the curd matrix. So, and even losing it, you know, dripping, dripping onto the floor. Um, so that, um, you know, salt, everything is, everything is connected. <laughs> also, if you have a cheese that didn't, um, that didn't drain properly, you, you, um, you are going to absorb a different amount of salt than you expected. So a wetter cheese is gonna draw up more salt 
than you would expect. A drier cheese, salt's gonna take longer to migrate through. So if you didn't get your moisture right, you're not gonna get your salt right. If you don't get your salt right, you're not going to be controlling um, starter cultures and secondary cultures as well as you could. So the kinds of cultures that you're growing on a cheese rind are pretty salt tolerant. And that's why we've come to rely on them. They naturally were just the last man standing. Once you add salt to something, you are creating a harder place for pathogens to grow. That's you know, why we use salt to preserve food. And you're creating a place that then you give a head start to positively contributing cheese making microbes. Salt can't, um, you know, usually the amount, the percent of salt in a finished cheese can't sterilize it. You're not gonna get rid of all of the potential pathogens, but you're really gonna make a safer product that's going to create favorable environments for the right kinds of microbes. They're gonna make the right kind of flavors and make your cheese safer. Okay, and then it's, uh, salt is going to draw out that excess moisture as I, as I mentioned. So if you're under salting it, you might be leaving more water in and then, um, you know, your acidity is not going to be right. I mean, it's all one, it, there's, no, there's no such thing as one problem with the cheese because one problem with the cheese causes four other problems. It's really um, maddening. I think, I, I like to think of cheese making as a cruel psychological experiment for the cheese makers where you go into a 90 degree hot white room every day and try to do some invisible magic <laughs> and get it just right. And then two months later, a salesperson's like, eh, it's just okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it is really a practice of patience and cheesemakers, talented cheesemakers are very special aliens. Okay. So we've got across the top here, these are the things you like the tools in the toolbox. And then the bottom here are the measurable results that we keep track of. Okay. So we've got the cultures that we choose to make acid at the right temperature, depending on our cheese recipe, and to grow the right kind of rind or make the right kind of flavors in the middle of our wax cheese. Um, but in the cheese making process and in terms of hitting targets, you're really, the, the way that cultures matter is really those starter cultures. What type of starter cultures you're adding, the dosage, the temperature of the room, the next variable there has a big impact on, on how active your cultures are, the temperature of the milk, as I mentioned. Um, the temperature of the draining room, uh, temperature being off by a degree can just really mess with the results that you'd expect at any point in the process. So that's something we pay a ton of attention to. Um, so cultures, the temperature at which the cultures work, uh, the curd handling, I mentioned different m techniques for curd handling like cheddaring or like um, washed curd, curd stirring, ladled curds. So those are all different manipul physical manipulations that we do. And then salting, which we just talked about. And then if we do all those things correctly, then we will have hit the right pH targets. We will have hit the right moisture targets, which we can check in house. We have a little uh, scale that also has a heating element in it. So you put 10 grams of cheese on a scale, you close the lid with the heating element. The heating element sort of cooks the cheese until all the moisture evaporates and it beeps and it blinks how much moisture has been lost. Uh, over the course of that process. It's a super simple machine, and so we can have interns taking moisture readings all day long on batches, letting us know how well we did. And then we care about the moisture content, but for reasons I'll explain during the math presentation, um, it's not just about the moisture that's there, it's about the moisture to protein to fat ratio. So there's three parts of the pie that we really care about. We can do fat testing in-house pretty easily and cheaply, you basically put a little bit of cheese in a blender, a little mini blender with hot water and um, I think it's sulfuric acid and blend it up and that breaks the emulsion of cheese basically. It um, kind of melts the curd and the acid breaks out the fat and it can all float to the surface. And then we put it in a centrifuge like a spinner and then all the fat floats to the top and then you can just literally look and see the percent of fat as opposed to the the solids left there, taking into account the precise amount of liquid hot water you added. In any case, interns can do that too. So we are able to check in-house moisture and fat. Protein, for whatever reason, must be a much more sophisticated, expensive process. So we don't do that in-house. But if we know the moisture and the fat, then we can infer the third piece of the pie, you know, all adding up to 100%. All right, salinity is another thing that we check. So usually cheese ends up in like the high 1% range and that tends to be a balanced uh, salt taste. Um, the, it can be 
a little higher, a little lower. And like I said, you can put the exact same weight of salt on the exact same weight of cheese and it'll end up absorbing a different amount depending on its pH, how permeable it is because of the minerals being gone. A more rubbery cheese, it's gonna be harder for salt to migrate. A drier cheese is gonna be harder for salt to migrate. So hitting the other targets is the best way of making sure that you're actually gonna get the right amount of salt in your cheese. So we use a little little salinity meters. Again, you can you know grind up the cheese with some hot water and then dip, dip a little salt strip in it. But we tend to just taste it. Our palates are calibrated just as well as those little pieces of paper where then you have to like make a judgment call on the color. So we taste for salt all the time, fresh cheese as it's ripening, and we use that to adjust our salting techniques or the cheese making process depending on what's happening. So. The more of this data that we're able to capture and share with cheesemakers, the sooner, the more likely we are to catch issues like, oops, someone left the door to the right to the draining room open and the cheeses aren't turning out well. Well, if we waited until the cheese was ready to sell and then tasted it and we're like, oh, cheesemakers, two months ago, this sucked. <laughs> Your cheese didn't turn out. And then meanwhile, they've left that door open for a whole cheese making season, which has happened to us. We had a really rough Wintermere season. And at the end of the season, like the last day, somebody finally realized that a door they were propping open to make another cheese work was, me <laughs> was messing up the draining. And we had a whole two months worth of just not great cheese. So the sooner you can get that feedback to the cheesemaker saying, look, something's not, something's not right. Your moisture's off. Your, your salt is off. Your pH is off. The sooner they can try to troubleshoot so that you don't get months worth of that cheese in the pipeline before you catch the issue. Um, so we use these tools to communicate with our own cheesemakers, even though they're only like 100 yards away in another building. And we definitely use this to communicate with our cheese making partners who are making cheese on their farms and sending it to us to ripen, um, sell and market. And that our, our ability to get this kind of compositional information to the cheesemakers really just helps everybody professionalize and do a better job. Okay, so um, I think that's about all that we have for today. We can get into anything else during ripening, but this is that bell curve that I mentioned. So these are all the steps of the cheese making process up to the salting. The blue line is what we hoped would happen, the plan. And the red line is that day's make. So it was pretty close, it's never perfect. And so you can see that the milk started when they when they put the milk in the vat, it had um, in the, you know, the mid six range, remember seven is neutral. And um, as you go down, you're getting more acidic. And then as those starter cultures were doing their thing, you can see it started out kind of slow, just slowly dropping. And then it like falls off like a roller coaster as that exponential, reproduction picks up and you have more and more starter cultures making acidity more and more rapidly. So over the course of, um, you know, those are minutes along the bottom, over the course of time, you're getting acidity dropping more and more quickly. And then at salting, that's usually where that bottoms out. You've removed the curds from the whey, They're, they've been draining, you're using salt to draw out that excess moisture, the loss of that whey that has the the active starter cultures and the fact the salt is slowing down your starter cultures tends to mean that that salting point is pretty much the bottom of the curve. And then as the cheese starts to grow its yeast and rinds or just ripen, um, even sealed in wax or whatever, that line will sort of creep back up on the other side and usually ends somewhere near where it started. If a cheese tastes brighter and more acidic to you, it's probably finishes at a lower pH than milk started. A cheese like Winnemere is so soft ripened. It's a low acid cheese to begin with. It, it doesn't get this acidic. It probably bottoms out uh, above 5.5 and then it gets so aggressively ripened. Its proteins get so broken down um, and all of the acid gets you know, metabolized or absorbed that that curve goes up above seven and you end up with an alkaline cheese at full ripeness. So the bottom out point and the finishing point are definitely parts of a thumbprint of a specific cheese recipe. And this is a recipe for blue cheese, our, our Bailey Hazen Blue, or at least what it looked like maybe five years ago. <laughs> We're always continuously improving and changing. Um, so the targets sort of change all the time, but this is a visual representation of those targets and gives you sort of an idea of what the map of a cheese might look like um, over the course of the make. All right, so I think that's about all that we have for today. Again, my apologies, Nathan did